He spoke of Sir Sidney Smith. Sidney Smith said he is a brave officer. He displayed considerable ability in the treaty for the evacuation of Egypt by the French. He took advantage of the discontent which he found to prevail among the French troops at being so long away from France and other circumstances. He also manifested great honor in sending immediately to Clavert the refusal of Lord Keith to ratify the treaty which saved the French eight days longer. Cairo would have been given up to the Turks and the French army necessarily obliged to surrender to the English. He also showed great humanity and honor in all his proceedings towards the French who fell into his hands. He landed at Havre for some Satie's folly of a bet that he had made to go to the theater, according to some. Others say that it was for espionage, however that may be. He was arrested and confined to the temple as a spy. And at one time, it was intended to try and execute him. Shortly after I returned from Italy, he wrote to me from his prison in order to intercede for him. But under the circumstances he was taken, I could do nothing for him. He is active, intelligent, intriguing, and indefatigable. But I believe that he is mitsupazzo, half a fool. I asked if Sir Sidney had not displayed great talent and bravery at anchor. Napoleon replied, yes, the chief cause of the failure there was that he took all my battering train, which was on board several small vessels. Had it not been for that, I would have taken anchor in spite of him. He behaved very badly and was well seconded by Filippo, a Frenchman of talent who had studied with me as an engineer. There was a Major Douglas, who also behaved very gallantly. The acquisition of five or six hundred seamen as cannoneers was a great advantage to the Turks, whose spirits they revived and whom they showed how to defend the fortress. But he committed a great fault in making sorties, which cost the lives of two or three hundred brave fellows, without the possibility of success, for it was impossible he could succeed against the number of French who were before Acre. I would lay a wager that he lost half of his crew in them. He dispersed proclamations amongst my troops, which certainly shook some of them, and, in consequence, published an order stating that he was mad and forbidding all communication with him. Some days after, he said, by means of a flag of truce, a lieutenant or a midshipman, with a letter containing a challenge to me to meet him at some place he pointed out in order to fight a duel. I laughed at this and sent him back an intimation that when he brought Marlboro to fight me, I would meet him. Notwithstanding this, I liked the character of the man. In answer to a remark of mine that the invasion of Spain had been a measure very destructive to him, he replied, if the government I established had remained... It would have been the best thing that ever happened for Spain. I would have regenerated the Spaniards. I would have made them a great nation instead of a feeble, imbecile, and superstitious race of Bourbons. I would have given them a new dynasty that would have no claim on the nation except by the good it would have rendered unto it for a hereditary race of asses, they would have had a monarch with the ability to revive the nation sunk under the yoke of superstition and ignorance. Perhaps it is better for France that I did not succeed as Spain would have been a formidable rival. I would have destroyed superstition and priestcraft and abolished the Inquisition and the monasteries of those lazy, bestie, defratty pieces of friars. I would at least have rendered the priests harmless. Take it, he is. You fought so bravely against me. Now lament their success. When I was last in Paris, I had letters from Mina and many other leaders of the Gideas craving assistance to expel their friar from the throne. Napoleon afterwards made some observations relative to the governor, whose suspicious and mysterious conduct he contrasted with the open and undisguised manner in which Sir George Cockburn conducted himself. Though the admiral was severe and rough, said he, yet he was incapable of a mean action. He had no atrocities in contemplation, and therefore made no mystery or secrecy of his conduct. Never 
have I suspected him of any sinister design? Though I might not like him, yet I could not despise him. I despise the other. As a jailer, the Admiral was kind and humane, and we ought to be grateful to him as our host. We have reason to be dissatisfied and to complain of him. This jailer deprives life of every inducement to me. Were it not that it would be an act of cowardice and that it would please your ministers, I would get rid of it. Tengo la vita per la gloria. I live for glory. There is nothing more courageous in supporting an existence like mine than in abandoning it. This governor has a double correspondence with your ministers similar to that which all your ambassadors maintain one written so as to deceive the world should they ever be called upon to publish it and the other giving a true account for themselves alone. I observed that I believed all ambassadors and other official persons in all countries wrote two accounts, one for the public and the other containing matters which it might not be right to divulge. True, Signor Medico, replied Napoleon, taking me by the ear in a good-humored manner. But there is not so Machiavellian a ministry in the world as your own, Chalitian of Votre System, that holds in your system that and the liberty of your press obliges your ministers to render some account to the nation, and therefore they want to be able to deceive the public in many instances, but as it is also necessary for them to know the truth themselves. They have a double correspondence, one official and false, calculated to gull the nation when published or called for by the parliament, the other private and true, to be kept locked up in their own bosoms and not deposited in the archives. In this way, they manage to make everything appear as they wish to John Bull. Now, this system of falsehood is not necessary in a country where there is no no obligation to publish or to render an account as if the sovereign does not like to make known any transaction officially he keeps it to himself and gives no explanation therefore there's no need of causing varnished accounts to be written in order to deceive the people for these reasons there are more falsifications in your official documents than in those of any other nation Tenth wrote a statement to Sir Hudson Lowe, purporting it to be my opinion that a further continuous of confinement and want of exercise would be productive of some serious complaint to Napoleon, which in all probability would prove fatal to him. Twelve conversed with Napoleon, who was in his bath for a considerable time, on asking his opinion of Talleyrand. Talleyrand said he, Le plus vieux des agiteurs. Ba flatter, said an homme um, corrompu, one of the vilest of jobbers, a base flatter, he's a corrupt man, who has betrayed all parties and all persons, wary and circumspect, always a traitor, but always in conspiracy with fortune. Talleyrand treats his enemies as if they were one day to become his friends and his friends as if they were to become his enemies. He is a man of talent, but venal in everything. Nothing could be done with him, but by means of bribery, the kings of Württemberg and Bavaria made so many complaints of his rapacity and extortion that I took his portfolio from him. Moreover, I found that he had divulged to some intrigants a most important secret, which I had confided to him alone. He hates the Bourbons in his heart. When I returned from Elba, Talleyrand wrote to me from Vienna, offering his services, and to betray the Bourbons, provided I would pardon and restore him the fairy argued upon a part of my proclamation in which I said there were circumstances which it was impossible to resist, which he quoted. But I considered that there were a few I was obliged to accept and refused, as it would have excited indignation if I had not punished somebody. I asked if it were true that Talleyrand had advised him to dethrone the King of Spain and mentioned that the Duke of Rovigo had told me that Talleyrand had said in his presence, Your Majesty will never be secure upon your throne while our bourbon is seated upon one. He replied, true, he advised me to do everything which would injure the Bourbons, whom he detests.
Napoleon showed me the marks of two wounds, one a very deep cicatrice above the left knee, which he said he had received in his first campaigns of Italy, and was of so serious a nature that the surgeons were in doubt whether it might not be ultimately necessary to amputate. He observed that when he was wounded, it was always kept a secret in order not to discourage the soldiers. The other was on the toe and had been received at Eckmule. At the siege of Acre, continued he, a shell thrown by Sidney Smith fell at my feet. Two soldiers who were close by seized and closely embraced me, one in front and the other on one side, and made a rampart of their bodies for me against the effect of this shell, which exploded and overwhelmed us with sand. We sunk into the hole formed by its bursting. One of them was wounded. I made them both officers. One has since lost a leg at Moscow and commanded at Vincennes, when I left Paris, when he was summoned by the Russians, he replied that as soon as they sent him back the leg he had lost at Moscow, he would surrender the fortress. Many times in my life, continued he, have I been saved by soldiers and officers throwing themselves before me when I was in the most imminent danger. At Arcola, when I was advancing, Colonel Murod, my aide-de-camp, threw himself before me, covered me with his body, and received the wound which was destined for me. He fell at my feet, and his blood spouted up in my face. He gave his life to preserve mine. Never yet, I believe, has there been such a devotion shown by soldiers as mine have manifested for me in all my misfortunes. Never has a soldier, even when expiring, been wanting to me. Never has man been served more favor faithfully by his troops. With the last drop of blood gushing out of their veins, they exclaimed, Viva l'Empereur! God save the Emperor. I asked if he had gained the Battle of Waterloo, whether he would have agreed to the Treaty of Paris. Napoleon replied, I would certainly have ratified it. I would not have made such a peace myself. Sooner than agree to much better terms, I abdicated before, but finding it already made, I would have kept it because France had need of repose. 13th. Sir Hudson Lowe sent orders to Count Las Casas to dismiss his present servant and to replace him by a soldier whom he sent for that purpose. The Count replied that Sir Hudson Lowe had the power to take away his servant, but that he could not compel him, Las Casas, to receive another. And it would certainly be an inconvenience to lose his servant in the present state of ill health. But that if he were taken away, he would not accept one of Sir Hudson Lowe's choosing. Captain Poppleton wrote to Sir Hudson Lowe, stating the Count's disinclination. And I informed him that the man he had sent to replace the Count's servant had formerly been employed at Longwood and turned away for drunkenness. Sir Hudson then desired me to tell Poppleton that the former servant might remain until he could find one that would answer, adding that he would look out himself for a proper subject, which he also desired me to tell to the Count, informed him that it was my intention to call in Mr. Baxter in order to have the benefit of his advice in the case of young Las Casas, which presented some alarming appearances communicated to countless causes. The message I was charged with by Sir Hudson Lowe, the Count replied, if the governor had told me that he did not wish my servant to remain with me, or that he would be glad if I sent him away, and that he would give me a fortnight to look for another, I would immediately have dismissed him, and most probably have asked the governor to send me another, but acting in the manner he has done without saying a word to me, I will take no servant from his hands. He treats me as a corporal would do. The admiral, even if displeased with me, never would have taken my servant away out of revenge.